Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. We are excited to bring you this training as part of the first ever Disaster Resilience Awareness Month. Throughout the month of March, Equal Justice Works is teaming up with different legal aid organizations who are then collaborating with a diverse group of subject matter experts to spread awareness about disaster-related issues, share resources for disaster preparedness, as well as recovery efforts. So for more information on that and to help us spread the awareness, be sure to follow EJW on Twitter and Facebook. This discussion today is brought to you by Disability Rights Texas and the National Low Income Housing Coalition. And we will be focusing on disaster housing options. If you have any questions or comments for us, please feel free to post them and we will answer them as we can. Okay, so let's get started. Today, like I said, we are lucky and very appreciative to collaborate with National Low Income Housing Coalition, specifically Noah Patton. No, first and foremost, is an advocate for safe housing and disasters and professionally is known as a housing policy analyst for National Low Income Housing Coalition. So let's first ask Noah about what is the National Low Income Housing Coalition and their mission. Yeah, uh, happy to be here uh, and happy to talk with y'all about this important subject. Uh, so to answer your question, the National Low Income Housing Coalition is uh, first and foremost dedicated uh, solely to achieving socially just public policy that ensures people with the lowest incomes in the U.S. have affordable and decent homes. Uh, our members, because we are an actual coalition, our, our members include state and local housing coalitions, residents of public and assisted housing, uh, nonprofit housing providers, homeless service providers, fair housing organizations, researchers, public housing agencies, uh, and the like. Uh, while our members include the spectrum of housing interests, um, we're unique, at least in like the DC, you know, uh, the DC, you know, sector, I guess, in that we don't represent any single segment of the housing industry. Uh, so rather, we just focus on policy and funding improvements for extremely low income folks who receive and uh, those who need federal assistance. Um, why we do disaster stuff is because NLIHC uh, leads the Disaster Housing Recovery Coalition, uh, which is a group of more than 850 national, state and local organizations. Uh, including many working directly with disaster impacted communities with firsthand experience recovering after disasters. Uh, the DHRC works to ensure that federal disaster recovery efforts uh, reach all impacted households, uh, including the lowest income seniors, folks with disabilities, uh, families with children, uh, veterans, people experiencing homelessness, uh, and other at risk populations who are often. Uh, the hardest hit by disasters and have the fewest resources to recover afterwards. Um, so that's that's just kind of a layout of, of where NLIHC is and, and where the uh, DHRC, the Disaster Housing Recovery Coalition stands. Okay, so while you don't provide direct services for individuals, obviously you're the leading expert in what disaster housing should look like. So- Indeed. I guess just explain a little bit more for people, what is disaster housing? Obviously we're talking about in times of disasters, but specifically what um, does that look like? Yeah, um, so disaster housing is, or, or at least it, it needs to be a central part of how we as a country respond to climate disasters. Um, so it's basically how we ensure that the survivors of a, of a disaster, um, all of them, hopefully, have, uh, have access to long-term permanent homes uh, after the disaster recovery ends. Um, now, because of the ongoing housing crisis, when a disaster knocks out housing, uh, whether, it's, whether it's rented housing or own, owned outright by the, by the residents, it, it creates a very real danger that folks will be unable to access housing again. Um, and we've seen that in places like Northern California where folks you know, have lost their homes in, in 
2017's campfire, um, but are still being forced to, to live out on the streets. Um, so that's that's basically what what disaster housing aims uh, aims for. Um, and and I can also just go into how that's how we fail at that goal uh, so far in uh, this country's disaster response system so far. Yes. So let's let's talk about a little bit more of the granular pieces and, and what options are specific for those that are impacted by a disaster and may be displaced or have home damage. So let's start with, okay, we so we have homeowners, you know, and then we have renters. But then we also have short-term assistance and then long-term. So let's start with the short term. What what kind of options could be available for somebody who's been impacted by a disaster? Yeah. Um, so I'll I can start kind of straight off. Actually, it it makes almost more sense to talk first about like emergency sheltering first, right? Because that's the place where you go. You need to leave. There's an evacuation order, and you need to go somewhere. Um, you can't stay in the place that you're living. If you're unhoused, you can't stay at the place where you have been um, uh, residing. So that's like the where do I go? And, and a lot of folks view it as kind of the big public gymnasium um, with cots set up by the Red Cross. Um, and there's some some real issues there in terms of disability access, uh, in terms of how they treat unhoused folks at those at those shelters. Um, because they can face discrimination. Um, and, but I did want to note just during COVID, you know, uh, we've been kind of moving away from that kind of like large gymnasium space, because obviously that's a, that's a public health risk. Uh, and we've been moving towards kind of this hotel, what, what they call non-congregate sheltering, which is basically just like a room with a door um, uh, for survivors to, to stay in. And that's mostly come in the form of hotels and things like that. Uh, and that was successfully done during this last hurricane season. Folks, folks were moved into hotels that, that were, would have normally been in that high school gymnasium. Um, and specifically in terms of, I guess, moving to, to short-term, what, what does short-term housing look like? Um, short-term housing is kind of the, so you've been sheltered in, in, a, in, a, in a disaster recovery shelter, and then you go back to the place where you were living, and that place is not, no longer habitable. Um, so that's kind of where the short-term housing comes in, and FEMA has been currently using, primarily it's, it's a combination of, of you might get rental assistance to, to stay in a, a rental home uh, in the area, um, while FEMA kind of like assesses your eligibility for future assistance from the agency. Um, so you could, you could receive rental assistance. A lot of times FEMA uh, utilizes this transitional shelter program, which is like paying for hotel rooms for folks coming out directly out of those emergency shelters. Um, and I did want to note just for folks that that are utilizing that transitional shelter shelter program, you know, that program does not cover, it, it, it covers the, 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 the cost of the hotel, but, you know, oftentimes it doesn't cover like the incidental costs and things like that. So it is important to, you know, remember that you may be required to put down a credit card, you know, when you access that program or something like that. And in addition, um, you know, folks have been evicted in as little as two weeks from their hotels after the, after they access that. So it's important to remember to always, you know, keep in mind that they're going on two week in increments for staying in that hotel. Um, in addition to the hotel stays and the rental assistance, there's also uh, this direct uh, temporary housing, which a lot of folks, I think, colloquially known as FEMA, FEMA trailers, as it were. And that's FEMA utilizes that when there's not enough rental housing in the area for everybody that lost their homes in the disaster. Um, and so it takes a, so it sounds, sounds pretty good. Uh, there, there have been issues in the past with like the quality of the trailers uh, and how much the government spent on the trailers. 
Um, however, it also takes a very long time to set up. Uh, so I kind of almost hesitate to, to label it as a short term housing program, because instead of utilizing like county fairgrounds or other mobile home parks to put those units in there, FEMA will select a location somewhere in the disaster area and just build a mobile home park on it. So they'll need to like hook up sewage, hook up power, hook up water and things like that, which takes a very long time. Uh, so it, it, that option is, is almost kind of looking more towards the long-term recovery as opposed to like a short-term um, uh, a short-term solution. Now we've been at NLIHC, we've been pushing this disaster housing assistance program, uh, which used to be utilized by FEMA, but has not uh, in the in the recent past. And it basically would provide uh, housing vouchers immediately to disaster survivors to utilize uh, the disaster. Uh, the, those vouchers are portable. So folks can kind of move out of the disaster area and, um, you know, stay close to their their support networks um you know stay close to their family and friends and things like that uh and utilize that but that push is still ongoing but that's kind of the solutions that you'd see in terms of short-term housing first and foremost right and i would like to say that we will have another session just dealing with fema because that is a whole other entity in and of itself especially with accessibility issues for individuals with disabilities, limits in English proficiency. So be sure to keep looking for those updates as well. But back to the actual housing um, options. So like you said, it's it's not, when we say short-term, it's it's relative. It's not, that's this isn't happening overnight. This is just short-term relative to the disaster, you know, phases. Um, but yes, it's transitional, whether it's direct housing or, you know, FEMA rental assistance. But then we go into long term recovery, which is more directed, I guess, at homeowners, I guess, if you want to say that right, Noah. So I guess if you could talk about that kind of specific, what would options be for homeowners and the long term recovery process? Yeah, for sure. Um so first off, that transition from short term to long term is pretty rough. Uh, and it's rough because the, the, the biggest federal assistance program for long term housing recovery, which is the Community Development Block Grant Disaster Recovery Program or CDBGDR, um, they don't let you be a disaster advocate until you can say that three times uh, quickly. Uh, but the, the issue with CDBGDR, which is run through uh, HUD, Housing and Urban Development, is that it's not a official, uh, officially authorized program. Uh, so every time there's a disaster, uh, in terms of long-term recovery, you have to wait around for Congress to pass, uh, to, to appropriate a bunch of money into that program and say, all right, Texas is going to get, you know, $50 million to, uh, uh, you know, through the CDBGDR program. And then HUD has to, from scratch, publish all of the rules and regulations that govern that program. So it's hard for like state and local folks to anticipate that. And even for disaster survivors to anticipate like what they're going to get um, because it can, because CDBGDR covers a wide range of things like, um, you know, like, CDBG uh, coronavirus covered, you know, advertisements on the New York subway system for tourism, you know, and things like that. So it also kind of comes down to um, what your state and local government <laughs> is willing to spend the money on, uh, which is kind of a job for us as, as advocates to, to push. But I will say that that gap, the, the, the length of time it takes to get that money out the door means that a lot of FEMA programs will, will stop or time out before that long-term recovery assistance kicks on from HUD. Uh, so, you know, that's a, a substantial issue and it's an issue to um, keep in mind that that transition is not smooth. Uh, you know, there will be gaps. Uh, I think a, a study just came out and said that it's, the average is 3.8 years for long-term recovery funding to, to reach a disaster recovery area. Uh, so that, that kind of gives you an idea of that. But when the money is 
<laughs> does finally reach disaster survivors that pays for things like home repairs, uh, home replacement, and it can also and and home repairs and replacement for homeowners. Um, and in terms of folks that are that are renting, it also can spur the creation of additional rental housing and things like that, which you know broadly lower the rents for the entire disaster area and can provide. Um, you know, units for those folks that are still displaced by a disaster to move to. Um, so that's been going on like right now, again, to use Northern, Northern California as an example, the, those projects um, utilizing CDBGC uh, DR money are ongoing, you know, still from 2017, but they'll, yes. but they will, you know, replace some of the lost affordable housing units uh, that were burnt down by fire. Okay, so let's talk about in blue sky times when we're not actually in disasters, you know, obviously y'all advocate for safe, affordable housing. Um, what kind of programs or how do housing programs play into a disaster, especially when there's such a shortage If people are on wait list or if they're in public housing and are displaced? If you could just kind of give a general overview on that, or if there are options after a disaster, if you if you've lost your home and want to get or need access to those programs, yeah, I, I'll say in terms of coordination, um, it you know none come the word none comes to mind uh, in terms of how uh, like existing permanent housing. Uh, or like housing assistance and, and homeless services groups kind of play into the broad, uh, you know, emergency management sector. Um, and that's because uh, a lot of times FEMA is, FEMA is like in a tug of war with the states over like who has priority on housing recovery and neither one of them wants to do it. Um, but so oftentimes, you know, those permanent supportive housing groups like they're they're they've lost units just as much as you know the general the general public um you know the the uh, sh uh supportive services and everything like they've taken hits from disaster damage they have staffers that that have needed to evacuate and things like that uh so oftentimes directly after a disaster is 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 not the best time to try and kind of get connected with that. They they do do a heroic job in attempting to still provide those services, but uh, oftentimes, at least in terms of uh, unhoused folks, you know, oftentimes like the the organizations that serve them can't handle that rapid influx of people that are now unhoused due to the uh, disaster on top of the population that they were uh, initially dealing with prior to the disaster. Um, so it's, so it's really tough. And, and, and that's like one of our policy points is that, you know, emergency managers and FEMA need to, uh, figure out a way to coordinate their response with those organizations to ensure that it's better. Um, because there, there really isn't that interplay that you would, that you would assume would exist, uh, after a disaster. Now there's, there's also groups like mutual aid groups, which are um, kind of more casual organizations that pop up after a disaster. And, and they've been doing things like during the, um, uh, the, the winter storm this year in Texas, they've been doing things like purchasing hotel rooms for those that need it and, and things like that. So they are around and, 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 you know, I'd encourage folks to, uh, if they're not getting, if they're running into roadblocks from federal or state resource programs to seek those folks out because that's you know that's their bread and butter is covering the um, the gaps that um, the eligibility requirements and, and whatnot that the federal government creates so um, so there is a little bit of hope there but oftentimes it's you know that that long term recovery money is going directly to the housing providers to try and rebuild their their units and rebuild their um, uh, you know, their housing units and, and things like that. Um, additionally, in terms of housing vouchers, like source of income can oftentimes get, uh, source of income discrimination can oftentimes increase uh, after a disaster. Um, you know, it can, you know, the, the loss of rental stock often drives up uh, rental prices. So sometimes the vouchers don't necessarily cover all of the rent anymore. Um, 
and a lot of HUD programs kind of utilize um, rental costs from pre-disaster times and instead of post-disaster times. So it's um, it's tough, but there there is a progress being made in terms of those conversations and things like that. So. I would say that that that's a great place that if you do not live in the disaster area to to assist and donate money to are those those housing programs. Uh, yes, that's is. always always greatly appreciated. So that kind of goes into our next part. If if individuals, if we're in blue sky times, what can they do one to prepare? And then if it's in a disaster, where can they go to seek help or know their rights? Yeah, for sure. Um, so FEMA and it's, uh, FEMA recommends, I think it's, I think it's up to a thousand dollars in cash now, maybe $500 to a thousand dollars, every household having $500, uh, in cash in their home somewhere in case of a disaster at some point. Um, but of course, a lot of the households that, that we advocate for at NLIHC, that would be a pretty heavy lift. Uh, and I'm not sure I would want that much cash lying around my home. Um, so in the, in the alternative, uh, you can do things like, uh, ensuring that, you know, ensuring that if you're a renter, ensuring that you have a written lease or at least some sort of written agreement with your landlord, um, because FEMA will, will need to see some sort of proof of, um, of residency at a disaster damage location in order for you to get, get assistance. Um, you can be more familiar with your local price gouging laws, uh, which I know Texas has, and I've seen, uh, during this winter storm, a lot of issues with like hotel pricing, um, with hotels jacking up the prices and, um, additionally, like eviction laws, uh, some localities have, uh, eviction laws that, that prevent you from being removed from a unit, uh, if a disaster declaration is issued, um, a lot of places that that need those laws don't, but they do exist in some places. Um, and you know, I, connecting with groups ahead of time, like Disability Rights Texas, or you know, Texas Rio Grande Legal Aid, or Texas Appleseed. You know, they'll really have a lot of um, um, material that goes into you know specifically about housing and evictions and 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 what kind of protections there are for you in your area. Um, in terms of homeowners and um, for in, term, in terms of homeowners, first and foremost, like FEMA will, will zero in on whether you have flood insurance uh, and they will be concerned about that regardless of whether there was a flood or a hurricane. Um, Cause at times, you know, that store, level of storm surge can count as flooding. Uh, and if you don't have flood insurance for your home, you know, that can be a substantial issue with accessing those benefits. Uh, additionally, a lot of folks, especially like in indigenous communities and in um, um, uh, black or brown communities have uh, informal title documents, or they may be owning their home through heirs property or something like that. And that is a substantial issue uh, with accessing any sort of government assistance because uh, FEMA will really require, will zero in on uh, needing to see that title document uh, to prove that you actually own the home that you were saying that uh, you do. Um, I think that's absurd. And I think FEMA spends much too much time focusing on waste, fraud, and abuse as opposed to um, actually ensuring that ex accessing that those programs are easy, but a thing that you can do ahead of time in, in blue sky times is, um, you know, find your lease if you have it, uh, make sure that you have a duplicate copy of it. Um, you know, if you do know that you have clouded title, now might be the best time to talk to legal aid organizations and try and get that process rolling because it does take a long time uh, and it is slightly pricey as well. So it's better to kind of space that out and not have to handle all of that on top of, uh, you know, recovering from a disaster at the same time. Um, in terms of where to go, so typically, um, you know, they have what's, what's called VOADs, volunteers uh, organizing uh, volunteer organizations active on disasters or VOAD. And that's like the Red Cross, um, you know, I've, there's also a couple um, uh, 
religious-based organizations that do that work. Um, so they will be, you know, hopefully in your community. Uh, they will be setting up shelters. They will be talking to folks about it. Um, and they'll probably be your, your primary first contact with any sort of like disaster recovery organization um, uh, immediately after the disaster. Uh, in addition, I did want to note, I know that, that I have already harped on um, FEMA's, uh, you know, FEMA's worry about, about fraud, waste, and abuse, but there are folks that do go around uh, claiming to be FEMA representatives when they are not. So make sure that you do, uh, if somebody comes up to you and claims to be FEMA, make sure that they have an ID badge. Um, you know, they have FEMA, you know, FEMA ID, basically, that they can show you to make sure that that's okay. And uh, especially so with any sort of contractor that may, might come to your house and say, oh, I'll take care of that for a certain amount of money. Uh, and, you know, FEMA will pay for it you know, hold up uh, on that and make sure that you talk to a FEMA representative um, before you, um, you know, believe any of that. In addition, I'd, I'd, I'd say talk to your kinship net, you know, what, what we call kinship net networks or your, where are your family or friends or, you know, what, who's in your neighborhood um, that, you know, kind of ha has it together and is kind of reacting to the disaster so y'all can react together. Um, oftentimes those groups kind of come together really informally out of like the local church or the local community organization. And, you know, they'll, they'll, you know, a couple guys with chainsaws will be able to clear the road a little bit quicker than if folks are, are waiting around for, um, uh, state or local assistance, um, you know, stay safe and, and, you know, follow, follow the authorities, um, you know, directions, but, uh, feel free to, to take a stab at that. I think that's, um, one of my, I guess if I could say favorite parts of disaster work is actually seeing folks come together and kind of informally create those structures because, you know, we can, we can take care of ourselves. We're, 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 we're good folks. So, you know, that's also, a, a, I think a method would be, you know, if you have water, making sure that your, your neighbors have water. If you know that there are uh, older folks on your block or folks living with disabilities that need to check, need to be checked up on, check up on, them. make sure they have the stuff they need. Um, and that kind of both emotionally provides support as well as very real support on the ground. Great. Uh, so thank you so much for that. And I think I just want to highlight that you know, for those of you that are watching in Blue Sky Times, just know that there are ways to prepare. If you're a renter, have your lease. If you're a homeowner, know your insurance policies. If you don't have insurance policy, know your options. In the event of a disaster, plan. Make, make your plan, whether you're evacuating or sheltering a place, and you can sustain whatever plan you have. But bigger picture is that you have protections. If you are displaced or your home is damaged, whether you're a renter or a homeowner, there are things out there to help and assist you. So make sure you're looking at trusted resources, whether it's National Low Income Housing Coalition's website or information coming out, or local legal aid organizations or other organizations out there advocating on your behalf in whichever shape or form. So you're not alone. There are things out there, and that's kind of the whole point of this series is to help build that resiliency within communities at the local levels and know that there are things out there to help. So, Noah, any last words of wisdom? I'd, I'd just say hang in there. Um, remember to, I'd say, you know, the next time you see is a, a good blue sky recommendation would be if you see any sort of public comment meeting about a disaster recovery, about mitigation or anything, please go. Uh, I know they're boring and they're very long. They're very long and boring for me as well. Um, but, you know, just making sure that your local officials um, kind of know where you're at, know, know what your needs are and what you're expecting of them when disaster strikes um, can be so important. So. Right. Well, thank you, Noah. Thank you, National Low Income Housing Coalition. And we look forward to answering and helping in any way we can. Of course, of course.